Greetings and welcome to the Animal Wellness Podcast, the official podcast of Animal Wellness Action. Hi, I'm your host, Joseph Grove. On this show, we talk about animals from the perspective of people who care about them and have the ability to improve their lives by influencing culture and supporting laws and regulations accordingly. To stay up to date with all of our news and information, subscribe to this podcast, receive our free newsletters and more, visit animalwellnessaction.org. So, you know, if you grew up, if you watch any TV, you know that the, the TV shows always have their very special episodes. So this is a very special episode of uh, the Animal Wellness Podcast, uh, albeit uh, a sad one. Um, this will be Marty Irby's last show with us. He's our executive director. He's been with us since the beginning. He's been on virtually every episode of the show, but today is his last one. Um, so so I just want to, to acknowledge that and, and bid my co-host a fond farewell. You've provided our legislative updates for, for years, Marty. So why don't you say a couple of words about you know, where you're going and, and how we can expect to see you uh, working for the benefit of the animals and particularly the horses, who I know you love so much. Thank you so much, Joseph. It's uh, bittersweet for sure, as I've been part of Animal Wellness Action and this podcast with Wayne and you both since inception. Uh, it's been a fun run over the past five years, and we've gotten so many great things done, getting 12 new federal bills signed into law, a ban on bestiality in Kentucky, a ban on greyhound racing in Florida, and then corporate policy that has advanced in other spaces. So uh, I'm going to Freedom Works uh, to be the chief operating officer there in Washington, D.C., so I'll still be on Capitol Hill working in a different space, but I'm still going to keep my finger on the pulse of animals, and most importantly to me, as you all know, are the horses. So I'm going to continue to help advise Animal Wellness Action as a volunteer and support that work. Uh, we're not giving up on ending soaring. That is what got me into this whole uh, deal in the first place. And we're going to keep pressing on. Um, so I'll go ahead with our legislative update of where we are uh, as I exit. We have several new bills that we have been working on. We have several old bills that we've been working on to date in the 118th Congress. We have successfully been able to get the Veterans for Mustangs Act introduced in bipartisan fashion. We have roughly 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats on that piece of legislation that would help us save federal tax dollars by administering birth control to wild horse populations on the range to prevent them from being born and later rounded up, incarcerated, and then paid to be fed and kept in holding. This would allow the Bureau of Land Management to create a training program and contract with veterans who can do that work. There's a great component between PTSD and horses and really all animals that we've seen over the work that we've done in the past. Several years ago, we got an amendment in the veterans funding bill to provide $5 million for equine assisted therapy. That has been very successful. We worked to get the Pause for Veterans Therapy Act enacted in 2021, and we're building on that work. So really excited about that bill. Uh, the second piece of legislation we've had introduced is the Opportunities for Fairness in Farming or OFF Act that addresses the situation with the USDA's commodity checkoff programs that we've seen so much of the corruption, mismanagement of farmer dollars, and many, many issues over the past five or six years. We've worked on this since the last Farm Bill back in 2018. We had an amendment that got through the Senate, was one of three that got a vote. We didn't win the vote, but we were close. And I think in this Farm Bill that's coming up, which is the main vehicle in the 118th Congress, we're going to be able to get something done. That legislation is led by a very odd coalition, but a great coalition of Mike Lee, Rand Paul, Cory Booker, and Elizabeth Warren in the Senate, and Nancy Mace and Dina Titus in the House. You rarely hear those names together. And it would bring reform, transparency, and accountability to these USDA commodity checkoff programs. We're also working on a new animal fighting bill, the Fight Act, that would add some additional prohibitions to help us stamp out cockfighting in the United States. That's going to be introduced soon. We're still working on the Minks or Super Spreaders Act that we passed through the House last Congress. We're not giving up on that yet. And we have uh, the Kangaroo Protection Act we've been working on for a while, but we've had a new victory recently we can mention in this episode that will tell us a little more about that issue. We have another piece of legislation, the Add Soy Act, that would help us bring in soy milk to school lunches for kids that have lactose intolerance. There's a big issue there where we're actually throwing away $298 million a year of federal tax dollars in the garbage 
in milk cartons unopened. So that's a huge government savings to the taxpayer. And then last but not least are the horse issues that we continue to work on beyond the wild horses. The horse slaughter issue has been ongoing for many, many decades. We believe that with a new strategy we have to amend the Dog and Cat Meat Prohibition Act that we got signed into law in 2018 to include equines, we can stamp out horse slaughter almost with one word. And my most favorite topic, my most near and dear uh, issue that Wayne and I met over uh, now 11 years ago, I think, of course, has been the Prevent All Soaring Tactics or PAST Act. Uh, that legislation passed the House twice. Uh, it stands, in my opinion, absolutely zero chance of passing the U.S. Senate as written. We saw in the last Congress where we had a Democrat Senate, a Democrat House, and a Democrat President, and we still couldn't get that measure signed into law. So I think it is honestly dead as a doornail. And the only way forward is a compromise that Wayne and I have been working on for now, probably three years with the industry, that accomplishes 90% of the past act. And then some other things that it didn't include originally, and then gives the industry some certainty about clear, objective, precise, science-based objective testing and inspections so that they know what they're getting when they're taking a horse up to inspection to be able to present it to the USDA for show and competition. We think that there's a good shot at getting that done in the Farm Bill as well. Uh, USDA, of course, administers the program and oversees the inspection, so it's tied directly to the Farm Bill, which is a huge, huge part of the USDA's legislative portfolio every five years when you see that bill come up. So there's a lot of good things coming up. I think that you guys are going to be great. Wayne is out there. I know every day we've done over 200 meetings so far this year in person and looking forward to seeing a lot of new things getting done in 2023. Marty, thank you for that. It's impressive as always. Not only everything we're doing, but your ability to recount it with such detail. I, I had to smile as you were talking about your, your favorite subject. I thought for sure Bob Baffert was going to come at the end of that. Well, we, we're, we're through the legislative fix on that. So I, I, we could talk <laughs> about that, but I kept it out of the legislative update. I, I, thought, I, I, thought, I, well, I, I thought I saw Bob Baffert driving around Louisville yesterday, uh, you know, honking his horn, you, you know, throwing out candy to all the children in celebration of your, of your departure, Marty. He probably is the happiest person in the country. That I'm looking at the wellness <laughs> I don't well, have Joseph, a boy anymore. <laughs> Joseph, I just want to say that, you know, Marty is, you know, I just, I've described him as a unicorn in, in animal protection. He, he's a, a uh, native of, of South Alabama. He's a, uh, uh, a true red blooded conservative. And he's super compassionate about animals, but you know, beyond that, you know, he's just tenacious in fighting for animals. He he's got great smarts, he's got great skill, he's got very good instincts on the issues, and you know, so much of what we've accomplished as an organization would not have happened without Marty. So it's a it's a big loss for the organization. I'm just grateful that he's going to continue in a volunteer capacity. And he has helped us build our organization and and uh, make it a uh, a lean fighting force. But you know, using the military uh, metaphor and getting off of the unicorn piece, you know, losing Marty is like you know losing a, a general, a tank commander, a sniper, all in one. So you gotta you gotta you gotta re replenish your army for sure. But the good news is that he's not he's not going away. He's uh, he's just gonna have a day job that's going to occupy him a good bit. You know, I think, but Joseph, this is an important point. I mean, one of the things that we've stressed, you and Marty and I in our work, is that animal issues should never be seen as just a narrow moral concern. I mean, it's warranted for us to be concerned about animals for that primary moral reason, but the intersection of concerns in society, you know, where Marty's going to a conservative-oriented organization, that has a real concern about fiscal responsibility. That's the frame at which it sees the world. We see that frame too. Animal abuse is propped up by the government time and time again, whether it's you know rounding up our wild horses and putting them in holding facilities, 62,000 of them wasting our taxpayer dollars, giving kids in our school lunch program cow's milk when a very large percentage of them are lactose intolerant, they're going to be be made ill. And they throw it away. That's not an effective use of tax dollars. It's not an effective implementation of a nutrition delivery program. You know, you think of the waste with the animal testing 
and the fact that 90 to 95 percent of the studies or the tests done on animals for new drugs, the safety testing screening for drugs to make sure that if a person takes that drug, he or she is not going to be killed or impaired in some ways, or testing the effectiveness of the drug. The data show that 90 to 95 percent of those animal tests fail to predict the human response. So why do we keep doing that? With a lot of that being taxpayer money that's being used on a pathway for testing that we know is going to fail. So I think, you know, Marty could have gone to a liberal group or a conservative group or a middle of the road group, and we still would have had an intersection of concern because animal issues are that broad. Animal issues intersect with so many other social values, public health, social violence in our society, cost cutting, personal health, uh, you know, the effectiveness of drugs. I mean, my God, we, we really, when we're, we've been working and Marty's worked a lot on this issue with me of cockfighting and Joseph, you've worked on this issue as well. I mean, this is just a den of criminality. It's animal abuse is literally in the center ring, but the, the side efforts are all, you know, illegal gambling, narcotics trafficking, money laundering, all sorts of criminality. So I, I, I've always felt that our work is so much broader than helping animals. It's really building a civil society and it's building a, a fiscally sane society. It's building a fiscally responsible society. It's, it's about conduct and being empathetic and concerned about individuals, whether they're people or non-human animals. So I, I think that, that, we're going to have a lot of intersections of interests with Marty, and we're going to have a lot of intersections with all sorts of groups in our society. And that's why I'm excited that we're going to be launching a webinar series with a lot of other organizations to talk about so many of these issues and the intersecting concerns. Yeah. More, yeah and I just, let me, let me add to what Wayne said about cockfighting too. One thing um, that you don't think about or realize is that so many of these cockfighting birds that are shipped transmit avian influenza, bird flu, and that has caused problems in at least 48 states over the past year where they've had outbreaks. At the end of the day, what happens from those outbreaks is the federal government, USDA, comes in, they depopulate or kill the flocks, and then they pay the farmer for the flock. So there have literally been billions of dollars spent to clean up the mess of avian influenza, and that's just another waste of our taxpayer dollars. So I wanted to make sure that we threw that in there too, because a lot of people probably wouldn't think about that. He's already got his new job hat on, thinking about uh, the economic <laughs> waste. Uh, we do want to talk some about horses today, not only because it's it's a cause especially dear to Marty's heart, but because there's, there's activity there. Before we do that though, uh, Wayne, we had a huge win this week. Can you tell the audience a little bit about what happened on the front for our kangaroos? Sure, Joseph. Well, you and Marty have been in the center of this as well, that we launched a campaign in 2020, really with the Center for Humane Economy, which is our 501c3 organization that focuses more on influencing business to incorporate animal welfare sensibilities into their supply chains, or d programs, and other operations. And we launched a campaign called kangaroos are not shoes, because I had become aware, and it was especially poignant for me to think about it after the fires hit Australia in 2020. I mean, we deal with so many, you know, calamities in the world, earthquakes and fires and floods, and then we've got natural other natural disasters, human-made disasters, plane crashes. We forget about these things. But a few years ago, those fires were just apocalyptic. And some of the scientists in Australia said that 3 billion animals died in the fires, 3 billion, and certainly millions of kangaroos. So my thought was, in, in, in talking to our entire team, was, you know, these animals face so many threats from, you know, whatever climatic circumstances have been created by human actions, as well as just the normal climate uh, changes that occur in the world. And these animals are threatened by drought, by fire. And then on top of that, through human action, we kill 2 million of them to make them into shoes. When all these big companies like Nike and Adidas and Puma and Diodora and New Balance, they've been innovating and finding other fabrics and materials 
whether they're human-made fabrics or they're plant-based products, where they've switched all the running shoes to these to these to these fabrics. They've shifted they've shifted all their golf shoes, tennis shoes, every category but soccer cleats. But they've been using the kangaroos for soccer cleats, and this is the most popular sport in the world. It's pl it's played in 200 countries of the world, and this is the central piece of personal equipment. They've got a shirt, short socks, and shoes. The shoes are the main thing. So we endorsed or we formulated this campaign called Kangaroos Are Not Shoes and consistent with the center's approach, asked these companies to do better. You know, evolve, just like Giorgio Armani and Coach and Nordstrom's gave up fur, these companies could give up kangaroo skins in making shoes. So finally, I mean, we had a, a breakthrough in 2021 with Diodora and some of our friends in Italy, um, animal advocates there did a great job in supporting this broader effort that we had engaged in, global effort. But then in March, uh, Puma, the first week of, of March, which is the company that really started this whole thing in the 1960s and then got the great Pele to lace up a pair of kangaroo-based shoes, the Puma Kings in 1970, that launched this. And then later Nike was created and Adidas had already come into existence. It picked it up. So we got Puma to commit. And then just a few days later, we got Nike to commit. So these are two of the biggest corporate gains in the, in the animal movement in contemporary times. These are, these are Fortune 500 companies. These are the biggest brands in the world. We've all purchased these shoes, you know, whether they're not the kangaroo shoes, but we, we, we buy Adidas or we buy Puma or we buy Nike. Um, these shoes are everywhere. So to get something that's such a common product in all of our daily lives and to make it cruelty free is a big deal. So we're super excited about that. No, it's a great win. And uh, Wayne, you, you probably would prefer I not allude to this because you're such a humble person, but, but this kind of advocacy here throughout your career is, is one of the reasons that One Green Planet named you the number one animal ad advocate to follow. Uh, mm -hmm. on in a recent story. Uh, number one, uh, so it, it's a terrific recognition of the work you do personally and the kinds of teams you build, including people like Marty uh, and Tammy Drake on the FDA modernization side uh, to get things done. So congratulations oh. to you well, on that, sir. That's very, that's very nice of you to mention. I mean, Marty got top lobbyist for a few years and Capitol Hill for three years straight running and we all know it's a team effort. And I think the thing that all of us bring and our organizations bring is we look at the macro level picture. I mean, we love animal rescue and we love helping individual animals who are in distress. That's a big part of our movement, but someone's got to stop those animals from getting into a situation of distress in the first place. We've got to prevent this cruelty. And that's what we're trying to do with our campaigns. Look at the biggest equine problems look at factory farming, look at animal testing, look at animal sports, if you want to call them that, like cockfighting and dog fighting and greyhound racing. So it's a it's a big, tall task that we have taken on for sure. And and uh, it's nice to get some recognition from One Green Planet. I appreciate it. It's always, you know, it's always subjective. And uh, I do think that our organizations, pound for pound, uh, really reward our donors. They make an investment in us and we produce outcomes like Nike, like a horse racing anti-doping policy, like the FDA Modernization Act. That's what I'm proudest of and, and I'm proud of our team. And obviously Marty leaving is just a terrible, you know, terrible blow for us, but we're gonna we're gonna keep him, keep him in the mix because I know his heart is with these issues. And not right. to not to have too much of a love fest here amongst ourselves, but I do want to say to you guys. I am telling you, Wayne Paselli is more committed to animal welfare than any human being on the planet, any person I've ever known. <laughs> Trust me, he could have been a United States senator, a congressman, could have run a Fortune 500 company and been a billionaire if he had wanted to. But instead, he has made his life's work uh, saving and helping and protecting these animals. And he's obviously more committed than I am. So no. <laughs> no. I, I know he will be doing this until the day he dies and be working to protect these uh, animals, the voiceless that we all care so deeply about. So you guys just know he truly really is the number one animal advocate to follow and know and work with. Well, that, that's so nice, Marty. Thank you. I'm humbled by your, yeah. by your comments. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. And, and Wayne, you mentioned donors and, and I would just want to encourage our listeners, you know, Wayne, Marty, the whole team, you know, they, they have and can, will continue to get things done. Um, the animals in this group are worthy of your support. So we encourage you to visit animalwellnessaction.org, Center for a Humane Economy.org. Consider putting us on your list of charities. If you care about animals, this is a terrific, efficient way to support that work. If you're not ready to donate, sign up. We send out phenomenal content. Wayne is a two-time New York Times bestselling author. He's a terrific writer. We, we bring a very sophisticated, analytical approach to animal issues. You will learn something in addition to being uh, kept abreast of the news. So please uh, consider at least getting our news alerts, if not helping us on our journey here. So, so thank you for that. And, and I will say, you know, Wayne had the One Green Planet, Marty's top lobbyist. Um, at the fair last year, I won a donut eating contest. So, <laughs> you know, we've got talent. Oh all over the place it's everywhere uh, let's get in let, let, let's start talking about um uh, some of the horse issues marty because you know we do we do want to get into to some of the meat meat of the show here uh, we've done a lot with horse slaughter lately uh, and and we want i want to talk about horse slaughter and get an update on anything going on with hysa and any other horse related issues wayne and marty that are on your mind this morning uh, as we record this. So let's talk about horse slaughter. What's the latest there and how do we get done what needs to be done? Well, I think, you know, as I said earlier in the farm bill, we have a great opportunity here. Wayne has been working on horse slaughter far longer than I have. I've maybe just been in the past 10 years or so when I worked on Capitol Hill and then now uh, in the animal welfare space. But it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity because 20, 30 years ago, there were 350,000 horses going to slaughter every year. 15 years ago, there were 150,000 horses going to slaughter every year, and now there are 20,000 horses as of the end of 22 that are going to slaughter each year. We don't slaughter them on U.S. soil because of a de facto ban through the appropriations process that shut down the horse slaughter plants that were operating in the U.S., but these kill buyers uh, actually are hauling horses over the border to Mexico and Canada, getting them slaughtered so that they can end up as dinner fare on plates in China and Japan and France and Italy and other countries. And it's just a terrible thing to see. It's unsafe because the meat is tainted in many instances by drugs that horses are given uh, because horses aren't produced for food. Cows and pigs and chickens are, and they're given certain antibiotics and different things, but horses are given a, an array of other drugs, uh, painkillers and all kinds of different things that can taint the meat. And maybe Wayne would want to talk some about our investigation that we just did and uh, how that all ties together with what we're trying to accomplish in amending the Dog and Cat Meat Trade Prohibition Act that we got signed into law to include equines in that existing statute. Well, yes. And, you know, Marty referenced when he worked on Capitol Hill, he worked for a lawmaker who helped carry this anti-horse slaughter legislation, Congressman Ed Whitfield of Kentucky, who is part of our team as well. And, you know, Marty's often noted that horse protection issues elicit more of a constituent response than any other subject, not just animal subject. In many offices, it's the number one subject of all topics, include Ukraine, include social security protection, uh, wild horses and horse slaughter are, are two big concerns in our society. And, you know, the Congress has not fully caught up with this and, in, in terms of this public sentiment that exists. And also, just from a parliamentary perspective, it's difficult to pass legislation. A lot of people don't understand that, for the most part, if you're not kind of viewed as a tier one issue, like tax reform or you know infrastructure reform or dealing with the, the coronavirus pandemic, you often need 100 senators to support your legislation. So that's what we had to get on the big cat Public Safety Act is what we had to get on the FDA Modernization Act. That requires bipartisan support, which has really been a hallmark of what AWA does. So horse slaughter has had solid majorities in the House and Senate for a while, but we haven't reached that unanimity that we needed in the Senate. But Marty noted that the Farm Bill is an opportunity this year. That's every five years that Congress takes up a big kind of potpourri of issues related to farming, food, nutrition, land conservation, 
and related subjects. And we always wedge animal welfare into that mix. Uh, and, you know, animals are at the center of agriculture and by God, they should be at the center of the farm bill. They've been on the margins and the periphery. But in anticipation of this, we work with Animals Angels, which is a fantastic 501c3 organization that has really done pioneering work in investigating horse slaughter. And we teamed up with them and did an investigation that covered 10 states and then our North American neighbors in Canada and Mexico and documented that there really is no horse slaughter industry anymore. There's just a loose collection of, of kill buyers, kill pen operators, kill transporters, and kill floor operators. These are people who think of animals as just a profit-making entity. And those animals then, according to our investigative findings, are, are subjected to just the most callous treatment. Their ethic, the, the kill buyers and the kill transporters is, we'll just keep the animal alive. You know, so the idea of vet care or proper food or, you know, clean water, safe transport, those are alien notions to them. They just want to get the animal, you know, they're breathing so then they can slaughter the animal. And our finding shows that there's no worse fate for a horse than to end up in the clutches of, of this network of, of, uh, of horse killers. And as Marty noted, the numbers have declined, which is great. We're very happy about that. It also happens to undercut the primary argument from the band of horse slaughter proponents, which is that horse slaughter was providing some sort of population safety valve, that there were unwanted horses and that we don't know what to do with them. And therefore we have to slaughter them and that effectively deals with the problem. We've proved that that's bogus. There were 350,000 horses in 1990 being American horses being killed in the US and in Canada and Mexico. Marty said it's down to 20. What about the 330,000 horses? If their theory had been correct, we would see abandonment of horses all over the country. We would see starvation of horses. We don't see any uptick in cases of cruelty or abandonment of horses, even though those horse slaughter numbers have come down. That proves that the whole argument was just a, a convenient sort of falsehood that they advanced for their own profiteering. So we're going to make the case, and, and I know Marty's going to continue to be working on this issue because he's a horseman. He grew up on the back of a horse and uh, has a special relationship with them. And we're going to just organize the millions of horse lovers in this country to demand that Congress end this monstrosity of horse slaughter. It, it's, it is awful. When you see these horses in the slaughterhouses and you see their, their eyes as wide as saucers, as other horses are being killed right in front of them, and you see our investigative video findings where a horse is down in a truck and being trampled by other horses because they have no room and they're all frightened. I mean, this is just miserable. For anyone to claim that this is somehow doing something good for horses, they've got to have their, their head screwed on backwards, honestly. They really have to have their head screwed on backwards. Yeah, and you know, it's not just wild horses. It's race race horses. Uh, it is former police horses, former companion animals. The horses that go through this horrible experience, Wayne, I learned in putting together the content for this, they could be the same horses that are, are petted and adored one day and then treated like like absolute discard uh, the next. So it's it's very personal to me on on that level. And Joseph, jo so you ahead. mentioned yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the racehorses, and Marty and I work really closely uh, with the Jockey Club, which is a very established horse racing organization, thoroughbred horse racing. And and the Jockey Club was a was our partner on the horse racing integrity and safety act that marty worked especially hard on and they are with us shoulder to shoulder on this anti-horse slaughter uh, legislative policy initiative so that's an exciting addition to our already formidable alignment of uh, of individuals and organizations uh, that that want to advance this so that makes us even more optimistic to have the horse racing industry behind this this effort yeah, it's really, I think, a game changer. You know, in 2021, we conceived and passed through the House by a voice vote 
an amendment to ban the transport of horses for the purposes of slaughter. In just a matter of maybe 72 hours, we brought together 230 plus groups in supporting that. We had everyone from the Jockey Club to Churchill Downs to the Prinkness and the Belmont and the Breeders' Cup to PETA. And uh, so we had all walks of life involved. It was a tremendous effort. We weren't able to get that through the Senate, but I do think that that really was the moment when things changed legislatively in Congress. When that passed by a voice vote, you could see that horse slaughter was on its way out. We're not there yet, but we're gonna get there. And I think that if you could all out there listening do one thing, the most important thing I could ask of you from this podcast is to call your federal legislators, your senators and your congressmen at 202-224-3121. It's 202-224-3121 and ask them to include a ban on horse slaughter in the upcoming farm bill. It's a simple message. And if you would please pick up the phone and do that, it would really mean a lot to us. And more importantly, mean a lot to the horses. I'll put a um, link to the report in the show notes. And I'll also include a link to an action alert we have that not only provides the phone number Marty just mentioned, but provides mecha, a mechanism to, to have a letter generated on your behalf. So thank you for that, that plea. Speak, you know, speaking of horse racing, Marty, you know, as I've shared on this podcast before, I live very close to Churchill Downs in Louisville, Kentucky. Already, they're closing city streets this weekend for a Derby Festival event. Uh, as we get into the thoroughbred season in 2023, uh, what's going on with the horse racing industry? Well, I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, we have been a part of helping prevent Bob Baffert, the biggest name in horse racing, from competing in the Kentucky Derby. Most recently, the courts upheld a decision for Churchill Downs to ban Bob Baffert from the Derby, so he will not be competing in the Derby again this year. That's great for the horses, in my opinion, and I think it says a lot about Churchill Downs and the industry and where they're headed. The most, the biggest accomplishment that we have made that has really satisfied me and made me feel rewarded about this work was the passage and enactment of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act in December of 2020. That law banned race day doping at all tracks in the United States in thoroughbred racing, and it also created a national entity, the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, to oversee horse racing in the U.S. So we actually had a court case where the courts decided that the law was unconstitutional. And I can't tell you how deflated I was at that moment, but because we're good lobbyists and because the Jockey Club had good lobbyists and there are so many people in the industry that support this, we were able to come back in December and get the law fixed. We actually satisfied what the court was concerned with. So we amended the law uh, in December of 2022 and believe that it will be upheld as constitutional. And I know after a conversation I had with Lisa Lazarus, the head of HISA um, last week, that they're really working hard to get this implemented quickly. And the new rules will be in place before the Kentucky Derby this year for the first time of any Derby in the history of the United States and the history of the Derby. Uh, just last week, uh, we were in the press talking about an incident at Turf Paradise in Arizona. The uh, HISA actually issued $151,000 uh, and some change in penalties against that track for infractions that they had. Uh, it was a wide array of them and they agreed to pay the settlement. And um, that's been one of the worst tracks in the country. There were like two dozen horses that had died there a year or two ago. So it's very, very encouraging as I'm departing Animal Wellness Action to see this new law being implemented and to see people being penalized for their actions it's going to be a much better day and a much better world for the horses because of this work. And, and Joseph, let me just say on this, you know, we haven't had horse protection laws in terms of authorizing legislation separate from appropriations since the early 1970s. You had two laws, the Horse Protection Act, which was designed to take aim at this terrible practice of soaring of Tennessee walking horses. And then in 1971 was the Wild and Free Roaming Horses and Burroughs Act. That's been a 50 year drought on, on horse protection uh, legislation. So getting HISA passed, the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act is a landmark. This, is a, this was a deregulated industry at the federal level in terms of animal welfare concerns. And the, the jockey club with its president, Jim Gagliano, was instrumental in this. I mean, you know, we were centrally involved, but the, it wouldn't have happened without the Jockey Club getting involved. And the Jockey Club would say, wouldn't have happened 
without us being involved. It took that sort of partnership. And that is a good example, I think, as we lead into the horse soaring issue. You know, the reason that these things don't happen in Congress is that you have two immovable forces. You know, in a lot of ways, we're an immovable force. We're demanding, you know, that this cruelty or mistreatment or doping abuses stop. And then the other side says, oh, this is our industry and we're doing fine. And, you know, we've got our own internal rules and you guys are exaggerating the case. You know, then you clash and a lot of the lawmakers throw up their hands. They say, well, we don't want to have cruelty, but we also really like this industry and they're providing a lot of jobs and money for people, especially in their local economy. So that's the, that's the clash. So the fact that we were able to get the jockey club and other key racing interests on board with the legislative reform is a big deal. Uh, people say, well, horse racing, you know, we don't like it. It's corrupt. You know, horse racing is not going to end in the United States at this point. So we can either leave the animals, you know, at the mercy of the worst actors in the industry, or could we, we can begin to have some standards. And I think of the horse soaring issue in this way too. Nobody wanted to end horse soaring more than Marty Irby and, and Wayne Pacelli and Joseph Grove and, and, and lots of others. And we built a lot of support in Congress. I mean, there's no question we could run a vote. But the industry was powerful enough to have enough people in the Senate to block the legislation. So we can go another darn 50 years with no legislative action of any substance, or we can work with the industry if they're truly, if they're truly going to sign off on and bless substantive reform. We're the last people who want cosmetic reform. We want to make horse soaring a felony. We want the we want the chains off of their legs. We want those those giant shoe stacks never to 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 leave an imprint in the show ring. We, we want the horse's tails not to be you know cut up or snipped or broken, you know, just for a show. I mean, this is a real bill to to address soaring. Now, is it perfect? No, but that's the world we live in. That's how legislation gets done. You know, I've been working on animal fighting for 25 years. We've upgraded that law five times. We're going after a sixth. If I had said, okay, well, in 2002, it wasn't enough to ban imports and exports and interstate transport of animal fighting. It wasn't enough to make it a felony. If it, it, we want, we want to have a ban on the gaff sales and the knife sales. If I had said that we didn't get that done, we would have never gotten started. We would have never gotten started. We consolidated important, tangible, practical gains that helped animals, and then we built on it. That's the way the law works. And this soaring compromise that Marty mentioned at the beginning of the show is like, you know, in some ways, it's like what happened with horse racing. You had some key players in the industry say, okay, we get it. We cannot continue to operate in this way. Soaring is not helping our industry, even if they're motivated by protective instincts for their industry, rather than an absolute moral concern for the cruelty of the horse. I don't care. I want the legislative outcome. Their motivations do not get reflected in statutory language in the Congress. What gets reflected are the tenets and standards of the law. And that's why we need to get this done. And for those people who say it's not good enough, give us, you know, give us your ideas. You know, let us let us hear them. Let's see if we can negotiate it. We we want to approve it as much as anybody. But at the end of the day, I don't want to walk away from it when it gives us 90% of what we want. Yeah. And that's I, what I like I, about our team. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, Marty, that and that's what I like about our team is that that pragmatic approach. You know, there are some organizations, I think, who who and I really don't have anyone in particular in mind when I say this, I'm not, not dog whistling by any means, but may rather have a defeat so they can raise money on it uh, rather than have a victory that actually helps animals. So that, that's my own personal opinion. I don't presume that's yours or, or Marty's. Go ahead, Marty. What were you going to no, say? Oh, yeah. No, I fully agree with what you just said. That is my opinion of some of the larger animal groups that are out there uh, based here in Washington, D.C., but um, I would say, you know, when I when I started this journey 11 years ago and I met Wayne, I really set out. I had had, you know, sort of, as Wayne says, a, a crisis of conscience and been dealing with this internally since I was 13 years old. And 
uh, probably the first big step was working with Monty Roberts in 2005 or six, who's a dear friend and been on our podcast before, and then uh, met Wayne as a result of the Jackie McConnell video on ABC Nightline. And I think that, you know, I set out to try to stop about 3,000 horses in the world from being soared, uh, if that many. Uh, but the great accomplishment that we had with the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act uh, has made that worthwhile, even though we haven't gotten the soaring deal done because that will help hundreds of thousands of horses over time. And I wanted to mention that we had a dear friend who was very close to Wayne and I, who worked with us. He was just as tenacious as anybody out on the ground, boots on the ground, protesting, uh, organizing these protests at the Tennessee Walking Horse uh, National Celebration. He always called himself the tip of the spear and had an organization, the Citizens Campaign Against Big Lick Animal Cruelty. That's a mouthful. Uh, but our friend Clant C., Actually, we learned on the day that I told Wayne that I was leaving that Clant C passed away last week. And so it's a very sad time because he's not going to be there, boots on the ground. I hope there is someone there who will pick up the torch and carry it and continue. I'm going to go down to Oxford, Mississippi to his funeral next week, and they're going to have a memorial service with a lot of people. He was quite a character. Someone described him as uh, someone who was uh, a jigsaw puzzle amidst a box of Legos and some Tinker Toys. And that's really a good description of Plant, but I just, I wanted to mention that amidst this because he was so key to all of these discussions that we're having with the walking horse industry. We drove them to the table with the passage of the Past Act through the house in 2019. It was a huge thing because Clant had actually gone to our, our other late friend's funeral, Joe Tidings, who authored the Horse Protection Act, met Nancy Pelosi. That led in the long run to the passage of that bill. And then his protests also helped bring these people to the table. So wanted to mention that, and we're going to honor Clint. We're going to continue this work to help end soaring because we know he would be very proud and want to see it get done. Thank you. Yeah, he's a, he, was, he was a character. He was an unbelievable character. He was definitely a friend of ours. He's the kind of friend, though, that you have, you know, you, you scream at each other because he was so demanding. He's like, you guys need to do this and you need to do that. Like, Clint, just shut up. And, uh, and uh, but then, you know, you love him the next day and and you love you love what he was trying to do, which was stop this this cruelty. And and uh, sometimes you get these eccentric characters in in the world and and you just think of those eccentricities as 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 special qualities in some ways. And he, he had a lot of those special qualities. Well, it's I, I regret we never had him on the show. Uh, I think uh, we did. No, I think we did have an episode. Uh, go back and look around the time Marty right. Roberts when we had the soaring. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, 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 Joseph, I'll double Joe, check. Joe, that Joseph has no tolerance for eccentricities. He wiped it from his <laughs> wiped from it. his mind. You, you know, and I'll cut this, this this part out too. But you know, when you're doing these shows, you're so in the moment of doing them that yeah. the content doesn't always register. You're, you oh, know. No. Yeah, I know. so so I know. I'll I'll handle that accordingly. I have a three minute warning. So Joseph, why don't you just close with with Marty and I'll I'll uh, I'll beg off for my There's next call. The, the episode, by the way, is November twentieth, twenty twenty. Okay, good. All right. Well, I'll cut out then. I'll cut out then the expression of of my lament, and we'll just go back right into it. Thank you for all that, Marty. I appreciate it. Wayne, I know that we're we're coming up against your time, and if you need to hop off, that's great. Uh, appreciate your being on the show. I, I do want to touch on one final horse-related issue before we close out this episode, and, and it reminds me of something you said early in this broadcast, uh, Wayne, and you say all the time, and that is that helping animals helps us or can help us all. Uh, veterans for Mustangs. We, we are inundated all the time with horrible stories about how veterans suffering from PS, uh, PTSD are, are coming back with addiction issues, with high suicide rates. The Veterans for Mustang Act can help horses and veterans. Marty, give us a couple minutes on, on what that is and where it is going in the legislature. Yes, it's a great bill. Uh, as I said earlier, there are 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans that have co-sponsored it. It was introduced in the House of Representatives by Congresswoman Lisa McLean from Michigan. She is a terrific animal advocate and has been amazing on so many issues. It's a bill that has been referred to the House Natural Resources Committee. It's HR 726 for those of you who are interested in looking it up on congress.gov. Um, it will really, really help these horses in the long run and help save taxpayer dollars 
because we're spending about $2,000 per horse per year of all of these 62,000 horses in holding. And I don't know what the math is, but that's a ton of money. Trump's acting BLM secretary, William Perry Penley said publicly many times it was going to cost $5 billion over a period of 15 years to round up the wild horses. In contrast, you can give a horse a dose of PZP birth control, administer fertility control to the horses to prevent horses from being born. They do it once a year through a dart gun, or they can do it uh, a different way in holding facilities. And that costs $30 per year per dose. Uh, after several years, many of them become completely sterile. So there's a huge federal savings going back to wearing my new hat where I'm going there. And at the end of the day, we're preventing horses from just being born to be rounded up and put in mass holding facilities, chased with helicopters, helicopters that actually have video footage. There's video footage we have of the helicopters hitting the horses with their skids. And uh, we think that this is a bill we can get done. It's, if there's any bill in this Congress that can get done, it's the Veterans for Mustangs Act. We even have Cliff Bentz, who is the Republican chair of the Natural Resources Wildlife Committee. He is uh, a co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, some great allies there from all over the United States. And I also would encourage you all to contact your members of Congress and ask them to co-sponsor that bill as well. Um, there's a film that Scott Beckstead and I are part of, and in. Scott's actually out in Las Vegas right now at a screening of the film, Wild Beauty, Mustang Spirit of the West, that has uh, a lot of the footage I'm talking about. If you want to check it out, uh, you can just Google it and you'll find the trailer online. Uh, it actually won the Boston Film Festival, uh, was named Best Documentary. Uh, later won the St. Louis Film Festival as Best Documentary, and that win actually qualifies it to be nominated for an Oscar. So I did not get into animal welfare to get in the movie business, but there is some small chance that you might see me and Scott Beckstead out there on a red carpet someday if this movie were to win an Oscar. And I can only just keep my fingers crossed that we hope that happens. That would be a fun story, if nothing else, just to have. Well, you need to give me some of the uh, material from you, the swag bag they give to the Oscar people uh, if you go. No, thank you. That's terrific uh, legislation. Uh, I'll put in the show notes a link to the Wild Beauty trailer. Uh, they have a great website uh, and uh, also whatever action alert we have for that. So, Marty, I guess that brings us to the end of not only this show, but well, maybe not all shows, because maybe you can come back as a guest sometime if we yeah, talk absolutely. about issues issues that are, are germane to your work and intersect with ours. So uh, thank you, my friend. And I call you that with all, all sincerity. You are my friend, and I'm grateful to have worked with you and uh, grateful, too, to all of our listeners. Thank you so much for listening to the Animal Wellness Podcast. Go to animalwellnessaction.org. You can sign up for all of our material there. Uh, Center for Humane Economy also may be of interest to you. A lot of the issues are the same, but there's some differences. Uh, so we invite you to check that out as well. Um, and uh, hit the like button on this podcast if you don't mind. And uh, maybe click that follow button too so you can get all of our ep episodes. So with that, I've been your host, Joseph Grove, and we'll be back soon with another episode of the Animal Wellness Podcast.